we have our final sermon on Abraham and Lot today, which is number 17. So I hope it's been a blessing to you. So I'll get you to turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 22 with me. And we'll go through most of that at least this morning with um, the grace of God and with the help of the Lord. Genesis chapter 22. We'll just read from verses 1 to 3 to start us off. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham. And he said, Behold, here am I. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and claved the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. Let's, let's open up in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again that we have this opportunity to look into your word. And I pray that uh, as I share this message with my brethren, that it would not be me speaking, but you speaking through me. I pray that your spirit would give us the grace that we need to understand your words and to allow the seeds to be planted within our hearts that they might grow and bear fruit for your glory. We thank you for your goodness to us, for your mercies which are new every morning, for your grace which sustains us along the way. And I pray that today would be a day when we draw closer to you, that we might be more like your son. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so this is the final, se- final sermon on this particular series on Abraham and Lot. And I pray it's been a blessing to you as we've looked at the, 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 the lives of these two individuals and along, along the way, the lives of Sarah and Abimelech and other people that have been included in the story which started from chapter 12 of Genesis, and now we're up to chapter 22 of Genesis. So we've covered 10 chapters of Genesis. And so uh, I know it's been a blessing to me as I've looked into these passages and I've, I've tried to put sermons together for you. But one thing I want to leave us with and I want to focus on today is this fact that the Bible calls Abraham um, the father of faith. Okay, And there's a very good reason that he's called the father of faith. And I want you to pay careful attention to all the things that he did along the way. And I'm not going to list all of them, but I want you to put yourself in his position because up to this point, Abraham has shown himself to be a man of absolute faith. And so from the first time when God called to him and said, I want you to leave your city where you live, and it was in Mesopotamia, a place called Ur, and I want you to go to a place where there was no one else there essentially okay so i want you to go to a place you've never been to before and i'm going to give you that land as an inheritance for you he packed up and went now i want you to put yourself in his position it's like you hearing from god and and him saying to you i want you to leave melbourne i know some of you probably wouldn't have a problem leaving melbourne at the moment with all the freezing cold but i want you to leave your city which you have grown up in and with the city that you know and i want you to go into the middle of the outback where there aren't any other people there, and I want you to plant yourself there, and I want you to live in a tent for the rest of your life. Now, that's essentially what happened. The man lived in tents for his entire life. He came from a city that had buildings and had had, probably many of the amenities that we're used to today, but God had called him to leave that, leave his family behind, or he brought his father and his nephew with him, but everyone else that he knew, his friends, his, uh, and all the things that he was used to in his life, and he took off to a place which was hundreds of miles away with his family and his goods, and he planted himself in Canaan. Now, that's a, that's a pretty big uh, step of obedience, isn't it? Because most of us would struggle with that whole idea of leaving everything behind and going to a place that you didn't know, yet he went. And yet he dwelt and was happy to dwell in tents for his entire life. He was also happy to dwell in a place that was um, a dangerous place. 
And we found out that there were, during the time that he was there, wars that had taken place between various kings, and he got involved in the middle of it. And at one point, Lot was taken prisoner, and he had to then round up his own guys to actually go and rescue him. And so he's left a life of, of essentially peace and quiet to go to a place that's a headache, okay, and, and actually dangerous. And then he's got to a point where he's had interaction with kings and he doesn't know whether they're going to kill him at any particular stage. So remember, he comes up with that ruse to say, I'm not her husband, I'm her brother, because he was worried that they were going to kill him. And that was what they were doing in those days. And then he gets to, we get to the point where God comes to him and says, I'm going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And he knows his, his nephew's living there. And he pleads with God and says to him, please, if there's just 10, would you destroy the city for 10? And God says, no, I wouldn't destroy it for 10. And then can you imagine his, his, uh, the anguish that he goes through when he sees the smoke rising up from those two cities? where he knew that Lot was living. On top of that, God had promised him a son, um, which he waited for for 25 years, through which God said, I'm going to bless you and bless all the nations. And in the middle of all that, 25 years of waiting for a son, when he was already 75 years when he left, and his wife 65, um, would have been a tough ask. And now, after all the things that God had asked him and expected of him, he's come through with flying colours. I mean, you'd give him an A+, plus, right, if you gave him a scorecard. Now, he's got to the point where this is like the pinnacle of what God could ask. And of all the things God had asked him, this is going to be by far the hardest, the most difficult thing to say yes to. And this is the pinnacle of all these and the culmination of all these sermons because God's now about to ask him something that you and I would severely struggle with. And it says here that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and I love the response here. He says, behold, here I am. You, know, you consider, you know, when someone comes to you and they've, they've, every time they come to you, they want something from you or something's gone wrong, okay, or something's been very hard. You know, the average person would pretend as if they don't hear sometimes. Yeah? Um, he doesn't. He simply says, here I am. I'm here. The, resp the response tells us a lot about the familiarity that he had with God's voice. He knew the sound of God's voice. And this is a mark of a man who has complete confidence with God. He's not shying away. He's not afraid. He's not worried about what's coming next. He's not saying to himself, oh, what's, oh, what's he going to ask me now? He loves to hear God's voice. And he responds to it immediately. And his response shows us the eagerness with which he has to want to please God. When you can contrast him with Jonah, and if you remember, God called Jonah and said, Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh and I want you to share a message with them. I want you to tell them that I'm going to destroy them if they don't repent. And um, Jonah says, to, no. Oh, what did you say, Lord? And he starts going in that direction rather than that direction. And God drags him all the way back, gave him a, a sea cruise at the same time all the way back to Nineveh and he eventually did the job. Abraham, we don't see that with Abraham. Every time God asks Abraham to do something, he's not shying away from it. He's not complaining about it. He just goes ahead and does it. And I want to, first of all, begin by asking ourselves, is this the type of confidence we have with God? Is this the type of comfortability that we have in that, our relationship with him? That if he would come and ask us something that is difficult to do, they would say, hey, I'm here. What do you want? What would you like? Because that's what we should learn from Abraham. How do we respond when God speaks to us through his word? 
Abraham didn't have the Bible with him. There was no Bible in Abraham's day. Abraham had to rely on directly on the voice of God. But we have the benefit of God's words within our hands. And so the question for us is, if we compare ourselves to Abraham, Abraham heard directly from God, but we, have, we hear directly from God through his word. And so the question for ourselves is, do we have the same eagerness to please God when we hear or when he speaks to us through his word? I've been looking at, uh, on Wednesday evenings, this, this uh, topic of the will of God. And that's the topic that we had at the young adults camp. And turn with me to 1 Thessalonians 5.18. Because this, I want to share with you two, just two little verses. Because we looked at this passage on Wednesday evening. And I just want to ask you two particular things, okay? First Thessalonians 5.18. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Just stop there. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Now, I want, you to, I want to ask you a question. What does that verse say to you? How do you hear that verse when we read it? Is it, does it go over your head completely? Is it something that you've heard so many times that you don't really think about it? Have, have we ever thought about that verse and what it actually means in practice? Because we've probably said that verse a thousand times for those of us who have been saved for a long time. But this verse says in everything, not some things, not the comfortable things, not the easy things, not the things you like, that you give thanks for those things. But actually this thing says, in everything, give thanks. Because it's God's will for you. Now, you're nodding to me, right? Who does that? Who actually does it? When things go wrong, is the first thought that comes to your mind, thanks God? Is it? Really? Or is the first thing that comes into our mind a complaint that comes along? How eager are we when God speaks to us to actually obey? First Thessalonians 5.21, just go down a few more verses. It says, prove all things. Prove all things. Which means don't take anything for granted that someone tells you. Make sure you're testing those things. Don't take things for granted from people that you, that you know and from people that you like. But just test all things and make sure that what you are believing and what you are sharing with other people is actually the truth. Do we do that? I'll guarantee you we don't. We take a lot of shortcuts when it comes to that. And then it says, hold fast to that which is good. Hold fast. Hold tightly. Don't let go of all things which are good. Now, when we read these verses, my question to us is, and Jesus, when Jesus preached to the, to the Jews in Israel, he would often start and end with, let him who has ears to hear, let him hear. Because the obvious thing is, and not everyone has ears to hear. We, both, we all have ears, but the question is whether we're actually listening to what the verse is telling us, to what God is saying. And that's a more difficult thing to do. Because I can hear something a thousand times, and not pay attention to it or not actually think about it to the point where it actually where I learn to apply it to my own life. How many times have we heard a, a, a sermon and there's been a rebuke in that particular sermon and the first thing that comes to our mind is oh, this is not for me. This is for brother so and so. <laughs> or this is not really for me. I'm, I'm okay with all that. No, I'm, I'm fine. I'm, I'm all right. I find that we do, we probably do that a fair, a fair bit without realising it. Or we, we, 
we run our eyes over verses and we don't we don't think they apply to us or we think we're you know wow that's okay i understand what that says and then we just go to the next verse without actually measuring ourselves whether we don't actually prove ourselves faithfulness if you're going to take something away with you today faithfulness is characterized by obedience you cannot say you have faith in Jesus and not obey him because the two are go together. Disobedience does not go together with having faith because having faith means I trust that whatever you tell me, I'm going to do and it's good for me. Abraham is an exact version of that. Abraham does that. So faithfulness is characterized by our obedience. Abraham's call to leave his city and his country, he does it. Abraham, well, you're going to live in tents now, Abraham, he does it. You're going to, I'm going to give you a son, he believes it. Now he's going to ask him to sacrifice. He actually, God asked him to, to get rid of his previous son, the one he had with Hagar, 15-year-old kid. He does it the next day. Now, obedience is something that characterizes the level of our faith. If we do not obey, it tells us something about ourselves. Okay? And I think we need to have eyes that are open, not to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the things people in the Bible, but more to ourselves. Because the last person that we often will criticise is ourselves. It's a lot easier to criticise everyone else and for all the problems that everyone else has got and for all the weaknesses and flaws they have when it comes to ourselves. That, that's a harder, much harder thing to do because that mirror is a lot harder to look into. Turn to Matthew 21 with me, verse 28. Matthew 21, verse 28. Just to reinforce this point with you a little more, it doesn't really matter as much to God what you say as what you do. Matthew 21, 28, Jesus gives this parable and he says, But what think ye? A certain man had two sons. And he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. And he answered and said, I will not. But afterward he repented and went. And he came to the second and said, likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir. And he went not. Whether of them twain did the will of his father, they say unto him, the first. Jesus saith unto them, verily I say unto you, that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. And get that. The publicans and the prostitutes are going to go into heaven before the priests and the scribes. Because even though they say no, they obey the word of God more than you. What matters to Jesus? What matters to God? The fact that I say a whole lot of stuff? The fact that I'm, I, I'm telling everyone I'm a believer in Jesus and that you know I've got a wonderful faith? and all sorts, Or is it the fact that, that we actually obey God? It doesn't matter as much what we say as what we do because if I say stuff and I don't do it then all my saying amounts to zero not to the world not to me and not to God the real test of our faith is our obedience and this is the testimony of Abraham's life so let's go back right to the beginning Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, 40 years before this particular point in his life. 40 years. Now, I want you to, to, to keep bear in mind, he left Mesopotamia when he was 75 years old. This is now, he's now about 115 years old. Okay, if we are to assume that um, Isaac is about a 15-year-old. 
So Genesis 12, 1, I want you to notice how he responds to the Lord. It says, Now the Lord had said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And verse 4, So Abraham departed. As the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him, and Abraham was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. Now, 40 years later, he's about 115 years old. And you'd think after 40 years of obeying the Lord, you might have a bit of a delayed reaction. But he doesn't. Because Genesis 22, 2. gives us God's command. And Abraham says, Here I am in verse 1. And God is now saying to him, and he says, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. Now, I'm not sure if you can if you can put yourself in Abraham's position here with the 15 year old kid that he's got and God and he's just and, and, and about what about a dozen years before God had asked him to send away Ishmael the other son that he loved he's gone now it's been a dozen years that he he's, he hasn't been around and now God's about to ask him to to give up not just send away, but to kill and set on fire on a remote place the son that he had loved. Um, huh. I'll tell you, if this is a test, it's, it's probably the most difficult test that any man has ever been asked to perform um, by God. There's no mistaking... The, the, the challenge here because now Abraham has a choice to make does he love Isaac more or does he love God more and that's the simple logic of it that's the simple that's the simple way to look at it because if his love for God is more than his love for Isaac then he'll obey but if his love for Isaac is more than his love for God then he's not going to obey Can you imagine God asking you such a thing this morning? What would you, what would you and I do? I know what I'd do because I don't have the grace at this particular point to answer this type of, of question. I'd probably delay this thing as much as I possibly could. Yeah, it, the scriptures here don't even don't even mention him saying, "What did you say?" But there's no question about clarification here. You know, as you get older, you know, your hearing starts to decline. And now I find myself, the, the, the most common phrase that I say to Miriam when she calls out to me from the other side of the house is, what did you say? <laughs> That's my most common phrase to my wife. You know, she might call out, can you bring me the keys? And I've heard, can you bring me the peas? And then all of a sudden... Life's not making any more sense. Why does she want the peas to be brought to the other side of the house? So then I have to ask and clarify that particular point because there's confusion. But when God asks Abraham, um, I want you to bring your son, the one that you love, to this place called Moriah, and I want you to, to slay him, put him on an altar, and I want you to set him on fire for me. <laughs> he doesn't even say, what did you say? He doesn't ask. And that tells me a lot about Abraham. He heard clearly God's voice. There was no ambiguity. Ambiguity. He doesn't run. He doesn't flinch. He just hears exactly what God tells him. And that, and that should be true of us, shouldn't it? Jesus t says, my sheep hear my voice. And I know them, and they follow me. So the question for us is, 
Do we hear God's voice that clearly? Are we, or do we confuse and muddle ourselves when God says something to us and make excuses for why we can't obey? And this is the point about when Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. Because Abraham was not only just a good listener of God's voice, he was a great follower as well. Because a sheep can hear God's voice, but if it chooses not to follow, then the sheep is not with the Saviour. And this is the definition of a faithful follower. Someone who has faith, someone who is faithful, is someone who listens, then obeys. Look at verse 3 with me. As a clear picture of his obedience, he doesn't question God, doesn't argue the point. What does he do? And Abraham rose up early in the morning. And if you recall, this is exactly what he did with Ishmael. God says, I want you to send them away. It's okay. I'll look after him. The next morning he gets up early in the morning doesn't sleep in, doesn't try to drag his feet, and he sends them away. Now he's, he's risen up early in the morning, saddles up the donkey, grabs two servants with him, gets the wood for a burnt offering, loads up the donkey, and away they go. That level of faith is, is I'll tell you what, is actually difficult to comprehend. For something so vital for something so difficult god's now asked him to, to to send away and to and to give up the other son that he loved yet he up and goes he up and gets himself ready doesn't wait that's our outstanding obedience and the bible says that god tempted abraham you know it's a funny word isn't it tempt we we we, we tend to often associate or only associate that particular word with you know tempting to do evil but so is the word provoke we tend to use the word provoke in only a negative sense if i provoke someone um it's normally a bad thing isn't it i'm provoking them to anger but the bible tells us to provoke one another to love and to good works and here god is tempting abraham to see whether he will actually obey and he does. And he tells him, get unto the place of which God told him, which is the land of Moriah. And there's something interesting about this particular place because it's, it's accepted amongst almost all Bible scholars that the land of Moriah refers to Jerusalem. Okay, It refers to that specific place. And so if the land of Moriah is Jerusalem and the surrounding area, then Mount Moriah is Calvary. You know that hill far away? Sort of an old rugged cross? The place where God was sending Abraham to sacrifice his only son would be the same place that God would sacrifice his only son. God doesn't mess around with his pictures or with his prophecy and so this is true here and it's and if that's the case that Moriah is Jerusalem and the mount and the mount where he where they went up on and made an altar is the place where Jesus was uh, crucified then that paints a perfect picture of Abraham being God the father and Isaac being Jesus the son and if you look at it Mount Moriah, if it is Jerusalem, for those of you who remember, a particular fellow called Melchizedek, okay, after Abraham had rescued Lot, Melchizedek, who was the king of Salem, which is the king of Jerusalem, okay, who the Bible tells us some incredible things about. He had no lineage, no parents, no beginning, no end, which points to the fact that he was a a pre-incarnate form of Christ. If he's going there and he's the king of that place, that's the same place 
where Jesus the king had, had ridden into that city on that donkey, on that ass, on that colt, and had declared himself to be the king. Do you remember when they were crying out, Hosanna, the son of David? Such a wonderful picture of God's eternal plan. There is no mistaking God's message here. Let's look at let's let's continue. On the third day, then on the third day in verse four, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. And so even though these other two men had come along with the, with the donkey, which had been loaded up with that wood for the sacrifice, they were told, you stay here. Now you've got nothing else to do here. It's just me and the boy. We're going to go up and we're going to worship. Now why was that the case? Why? Because God alone is responsible for our salvation. No animal, no man, nothing else and no one else had a hand in our salvation. He paid the price. He made the plan. And now he was going to make his son bear that wood upon his own shoulders up that hill. The men couldn't carry that wood. The beast wasn't allowed to carry that wood. And even though Abraham was a fairly old man and Isaac was a very young teen, Abraham laid the wood for the sacrifice of his own son on his own son's shoulders and he went up with a knife and with a, f a flame of fire. We, when it comes to salvation... The Bible clearly teaches us that God and God alone has provided that salvation for us. We didn't take a part in it. We couldn't help with it. He just did it for us. Salvation is clearly something that it was initiated, performed and sustained by the Lord himself. And the Bible tells us clearly that God loved this world so much that he gave his only begotten son and we can bring nothing of ourselves because we have nothing to bring. All we can do is stand from a distance like those two men and just be in awe of the, of the work that God was doing. When you think about that, the fact that they were two young men. I mean, the, the Bible often speaks of the strength of a young man, Okay the strength of the youngest and, and strongest man couldn't do anything. Not required. Isaac alone had to bear that wood up that mountain. And he did it, the young lad. But then he became confused. Because in verse 7, it says, And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father, and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son, and he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went, both of them, together. Now, Abraham's response to his son is prophetic from the point of view that God was going to provide himself a sacrifice for all of mankind. Did Abraham know that there was going to be this ram that was going to be caught in a thicket? I don't think he did. I think he had perfect faith because God had promised him that through Isaac, he was going to bless the, the entire world. I think he had perfect faith that even though he killed his own son and then set him on a light, that he was still going to have his son somehow. That's the faith that God had. Oh, sorry, that Abraham had for the Lord. And you'll notice what he says in verse 8. 
that God's going to provide himself a lamb. It wasn't another animal. And that's the lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world. And so let's continue. It says in verse 9, And they came to the place which God had told him of, and Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. So once again, you have this picture of Isaac not only now carrying the wood up that hill, but once that wood is laid down, that Isaac, sorry, that Isaac carried it up, that Isaac would now be laid on top of it and bound. And once again, we have this picture of the crucifixion. Because not only was, did Jesus carry his own cross to the site where they were going to crucify him, but they then bound him to that cross as well. Now, Isaac was bound with ropes, but Jesus was bound to that cross with nails. And either way, it was a picture of the willingness of Jesus to go there. You see, Isaac is bound his dad's got a knife he's laid him on top of the on top of this wood they've built an altar they've laid the wood and now Isaac's on there and he's bound and there's no record of Isaac saying dad what are you doing which means you know you're a 15 year old kid I remember I used to run pretty fast when my dad got upset I remember once we got, we, we bought one of those, do they have many more, you know, the above ground pools? Yeah. Anyway, so one of those round things, you know, we had a lot of fun in those things. It was about only about three and a half feet high and it had that blue skin that went inside and, and then my dad had bought this filter that went on the outside of it. You know, that's, that, that was like a motor. It had to be wired up and everything. And so there was this filter with two tubes that went over the top so one tube would, would squirt the water in and the other tube would suck the water in through the filter and blah, blah, blah would go. And I remember my dad saying to us, be careful for that filter. And so one day playing soccer, you know how a, right, a fantastic right foot I am. Um, I broke those two things that went over with a perfect kick at the right angle. Anyway, so... I tried to put them back as neatly as I could, but didn't fool my dad, apparently. Um, and I remember running around that pool. It was, I didn't realise my dad was actually that fast, but he actually caught up with me. And, uh, and the, the shoe size, I realised the size of his shoe as well. Um, good memories. <laughs> but you're a 15-year-old kid. And your dad's 115. Right? And your dad's told you, God's going to provide the, the lamb here. And all of a sudden it says, oh, come here, son. Sit up here on this wood. Oh, dad, are you upset with me for something? <laughs> no, it's all good. Now just hold your hands out. I'm going to tie them up. Where's my knife? <laughs> Seriously? Um, you'd be down that hill... In a flash, wouldn't you? He didn't. He didn't. So we have Isaiah 53 verse 7 that says he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. And that became the picture of our Saviour who willingly went to the cross, didn't open his mouth and allowed himself to be crucified for our sake. And this was the test of Abraham's faith. Because Abraham's, uh, God saw Abraham's faith on full display. 
no, this was not just for God's. This is actually this is not for God's benefit. This is for our benefit, and this is for the benefit of the angels that were watching, because they saw what was going on, and we can read what happened. And so it's still after after three and a half thousand years, we are still being inspired by this, and the angels have not forgotten. And so in verse 11 and 12, it says, The angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. <laughs> that would have been three nice words. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know us that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. I love the way the angel calls out, Abraham, Abraham. It mentions his name twice. Right? To make sure that uh, he's heard, this is a pretty important thing that he got his attention for. And what a dramatic scene. Like if you're going to have the, a scene for a movie, it's going to be this. With the guy with a knife ready to go down, the sun tied up on this wood. And then all of a sudden, in the, in, is, when he's a, just about to do it, God calls out from heaven and says, wait. Don't do it. What a dramatic scene. But it shows you the faith of this guy. It shows you the faith of Abraham and the obedience of his son. That he would, that he would allow his father to do that to him. And this father, that he would follow through on what God had called him to do. Abraham indeed did fear God. And that's the reason why he's held up as such an example of faith. But I wonder about our own faith sometimes, or lack of it. When we see the fruits of our own life, do we have anywhere near this type of faith? I want you to consider, he was not born again. People in the Old Testament were not born again. They did not have the, the spirit of the living God living inside them. Yet here we are today, and we're quite uncomfortable where we are. And we say that the spirit of God dwells within our hearts. God himself dwells within us. And yet, I don't know whether I see this faith among us. Because I see us fall over at the smallest things sometimes. And I wonder whether, whether we are kidding ourselves here. Does our faith come anywhere near this type of faith? I mean, sometimes the, the, the scripture will say, love thy you know, enemy or love thy neighbor. We can't even do that, honestly. What, what, would, what, what would we do if God asked us something a lot harder to do? That's more difficult. That's more incomprehensible for us. Yet here is Abraham and he's followed through. And yet we seem to fail at the most mundane and trivial of things. Maybe we deceive ourselves too often that our faith is somehow solid. It's easy to say your faith is solid when you don't suffer any persecution. It's easy to say your faith is solid when you're in a comfortable position, when you're actually not threatened by anything, when you've got enough food on the table, when you've got enough clothes to wear and a house to live in. You know, you've got people around you. Yeah, we go through things that the world goes through, but nothing special really. And yet maybe we convince ourselves too easily that somehow we have a strong faith. I don't know. Sometimes I wonder how far our foolishness actually goes and how disappointing the angels are or how disappointed the angels are when they see what we've got going on in our lives. And what we, what we say is a life of faith. Let me ask you, when was the last time you failed God? Do you know that answer? When was the last time you failed God? Now, when I, when I ask that, I'm not saying that you know, God called me to be a, you know, a missionary and then I said, no, I'm taking probably yesterday when God said to you to speak to someone concerning the faith or to comfort someone and you said no or maybe to obey in this particular area and you said no or maybe you know what I feel like more of a sleeping than actually doing God's work 
you know what I mean? Or, or you know, I'd rather have fun watching TV or going to the footy or doing something like that because you know what? That's I need fun in my life. I need happiness in my life. And if God's going to consume my life, you know, surely He's not going to ask me to live in a tent for my whole life, is He? No, I couldn't bear that. Uh, but you know, but there's a balance I have to find with God here. And you know, if I give God three hours a week of my time, you know, I'll go to church. I'll do a bit of praying here and there. I'll read a Bible a bit. And you know what? That's okay. God's, God knows my heart. Yes. And that's the problem. He does know our hearts. He knows the games we play. And even though we might convince ourselves that we, that we play a very good game, God's not a fool. God's not a fool at all. And if, and if we're ever to get to the point where we say that, oh, God's asking us something unreasonable, uh, then we are kidding ourselves all the way. But Galatians 6, 7 says, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. For he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. We can fool ourselves. And we often do. But we can't fool God. He's not mocked. When we read the word of God and we skim over verses that we refuse to apply to our own selves and expect others to live out those verses, then we are playing the hypocrite. And my hope is that we don't play the hypocrite. God doesn't like hypocrites. In fact, Jesus warned his disciples that one of the the worst fruits that he hated was hypocrisy and he called it the yeast of the Pharisees. So please, the Bible says to examine yourself whether you are in the faith. And that can only really be done by examining whether you actually obey the word of God or not. So let's go to verse 13. As we wrap up this sermon. And it says, And Abraham lifted, lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by, the, by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah-Jireh, as it is said to this day, In the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. What a beautiful phrase. So God indeed did provide a lamb, Okay, in the place of Isaac, and God in, and it was caught in by its horns, and it became a picture of sin. Okay, and that's a bit like a person trapped by their sin, can't move forward or back, and eventually they will either allow God to pay for that sin, or they will have to pay for it themselves. And the Bible says that Jesus took on that form. He became sin for us. And he suffered that we might not have to die and to pay for our own sins. God provided, like he did with Abraham, a replacement for us in the stead of. And this is the atonement that God provides. That in the place of, in the stead of, Isaac, God gave a ram. In the stead of, put your own, own name there. God provided Jesus, his son. And where it says here that in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen, <laughs> praise God, in that mount it was seen. Because 2,000 years ago, the mount that we call Calvary, a place also called Golgotha or the place of the skull, which is Mount Moriah, that blood that, that ran down that wood cleansed us of our sins. In the life of Abraham, we have much to be thankful for, for his faithfulness, for his fear of the Lord, for his obedience, for his example to us. Please do not let his example go to waste. Use it. Apply it to yourself. The word of God is meant to be used like a mirror for us. 
that we can actually look at ourselves clearly. And God has provided the life of Abraham as a mirror for ourselves. And the question is, when I reflect my life in Abraham's, what do I see? Do I see a man of faith? Do I see someone who is obedient to the word of God? Do I see someone who is eager to say, yes, Lord, I'm here. What would you like? Or am I so busy with my life? Am I so wrapped up in the things that I love, that my flesh desires, that I've got no time to answer God? And so turn with me to Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Because Abraham shows us what a reasonable faith looks like. Okay, He shows us what faith looks like. And that's why the Apostle Paul beseeches every believer something. Romans 12, 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, and we have received much mercy from God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your unreasonable service. It's reasonable. God's not asking you to, to, to clave wood and, and go up a mountain and sacrifice yourself and, and, and kill yourself for him. He's asking you to present your body to him in his service as a living thing. In obedience. Let's examine ourselves regarding that. Are our lives really a life of living obedience and living sacrifice? Please, don't let these sermons go to waste. Don't let the life of Abraham go to waste. Because when the angel responded from heaven a second time, in verses 15 to 18, it says, The angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time and said, By myself have I sworn. In other words, God doesn't need to swear by anyone else or with anyone else. He doesn't need anything. When God makes a promise, that's it. He says, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing, and it's not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies, the gates of hell, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. Because of Abraham's obedience, we are blessed today. And if you would simply obey God, then people around you will be blessed too. That's how God works. And the Lord fulfills his promises. Whatever he promises, he delivers. And the Lord fulfilled his promise to Abraham. He did it in the most amazing of ways. And this is the story of the gospel, the good news, that God provided himself a sacrifice, a spotless lamb, who was his gift to all of mankind. And Abraham became a picture of that. And so, closing with this passage, Galatians 3, 7 to 9. It says, Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scriptures, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen, that's us, through faith, preached before the gospel of unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then, they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. If this morning you are a believer who has put your faith in Jesus Christ to save you from your sins, then by definition you are a child by faith of Abraham. And you are blessed already. And so my challenge to all of us this morning is to live lives of faith. You see, this church is called Faith Baptist Church. It's not called something else. So my, my hope is that for those, for those of us who attend this church, who call this church home and family, that our lives would epitomize lives of faith. 
And that those lives of faith would show the world what obedience to God actually is. And that through our obedience, God would continue to bless this world because it's only reasonable for us to give our lives to him. God bless you. Thank you.